Welcome to Science Class. Two videos on Halloween today. On May 29th, 1919, Arthur Eddington took a picture of the total solar eclipse. The subject of the photograph, however, was not the sun and moon, but instead it was another star. 14 years earlier, Albert Einstein had proposed an immensely creative and complicated idea. Space and time are not two distinct things, but rather two sides of the same coin. This kind of revelation had occurred in the previous century, where we learned that electricity and magnetism are two properties of the same force, electromagnetism. But space and time, I mean, come on. A sound scientific hypothesis is one that can be tested, because as I explained last time, that's how scientific ideas are confirmed or ruled out. I'm not going to outline the specifics of general relativity here. I'm not really Tony Stark. I'm just a guy that got a C in college physics. But I can tell you how this test that Arthur Eddington did proved Einstein's predictions. There is a star many light years behind the sun. And on this particular day, from this particular point of the world, the straight line path from the observer to that star cuts through the very edge of the sun. So in other words, the sun is in the way just a little bit. But the sun's incredible mass bends the fabric of space and time around it, deflecting the pathway of light. Light always takes a straight path through a vacuum. So when this picture was taken, the star, which is behind the sun, was visible. This is called gravitational lensing. Hardly ever had such a strange and powerful prediction in history ever come true. But that was the genius of Einstein's idea. Okay, hopefully you're still there. No, you didn't click the wrong video. This is still plate tectonics. I only bring up that story because today we are going to discuss how we know plate tectonics theory is true. Wegener's evidence confirmed predictions about what we would find if the continents were at one point connected together. But remember, he never laid out a theory on how the continents had moved. Today, we are going to learn about the physical evidence scientists have found by studying the Earth to know for sure that the lithosphere is in motion. Let's get started. We will begin today by discussing magnetism. I have here some ferrofluid, a magnetic fluid made of iron nanoparticles, I think. But anyways, it is sensitive to magnetic fields and it traces the magnetic field lines, which are otherwise invisible. This little doodad is stabilized by this point, but is levitated by a magnetic field. If you spin it correctly, it hovers within that magnetic field for a long time. This hourglass contains iron shavings, which cling together when the magnet is present, but then don't when it isn't. Iron shavings on a table can show you the magnetic field surrounding a magnet. Materials that are attracted to magnetic fields will do this if they're allowed to. There's no resisting it. Magma that comes up to Earth's surface, where it then becomes lava, has a lot of iron minerals within it. These iron minerals will end up orientated along Earth's magnetic field. So the basalt on the ocean floor and layers of erupted material on or near volcanoes preserves a record of mineral crystals which point to the North Pole. So when scientists looked at the iron mineral structure of the ocean floor, they were confused when it didn't always point north. There are these alternating bands preserving a reversal in polarity. The pattern repeats itself on either side of the mid-ocean ridge, expanding out towards the continents. This gave us a bonus discovery. Earth's magnetic north and south poles flip every so often. These reversals occur at random intervals, ranging from a reversal after 20,000 years or so to almost a million years between reversals. And we really don't know why it happens, but it clearly does happen. There's no other logical sound explanation for this perfectly repeating pattern of alternating polarity. This is known as paleomagnetism. It's impossible to change the alignment of these iron minerals once the rock has crystallized. And even if it were possible, why would there be alternating bands rather than all magnetic minerals pointing towards the current North Pole? This only makes sense if we imagine magma coming up to the surface constantly at the mid-ocean ridge, crystallizing, 
and preserving the orientation of the magnetic North Pole wherever that happens to be at that time. And again, we have a repeating pattern on each side of the mid-ocean ridge. If this pattern weren't consistent, it would be a disaster for plate tectonics theory, but it is consistent. So there, earthquake patterns tell us a lot about the mechanisms of plate tectonics. Earthquakes happen at random times, but not in random places. Maps of Earth's tectonic plates are made from connecting the dots from earthquake epicenters. That's why these two pictures match so well. We touched on this last time, but you'll notice how some plate boundaries have far fewer earthquakes than others. It is the convergent boundaries that produce the greatest number of earthquakes. But it also matters at what depth the earthquakes occur. When two plates collide, and one of them contains oceanic crust, one of those plates will subduct. As the plate plunges into the upper mantle, it keeps generating earthquakes at depths up to 700 kilometers below the surface. At least in theory, that's what would happen if everything we've discussed about the mechanisms of plate motion were true. We'll just have to look at the data and, oh geez, would you look at that? Deep focus earthquakes don't occur randomly. They occur exactly where you would expect, next to ocean trenches. If deep focus earthquakes occurred at divergent boundaries, we'd have another huge problem with our theory, but they never do. So there, there's further evidence here as well. Let's look closer at one of those trenches. Do you notice how the deep focus earthquakes are all just to one side of the trench? This tells us what direction the plate is sinking. If a deep focus earthquake all of a sudden popped up on the other side of the trench, then we would have to admit maybe we don't really know what's going on down there. But they never do. So there. Radiometric dating was one of the great scientific achievements of the early 20th century. We can tell when a rock crystallized from magma or lava by analyzing its ratios of radiometric isotopes. We're going to get into the details of that in the next unit. But for now, all I want to show you is what we find when we look at the ocean floor. Seafloor spreading, the process of new oceanic lithosphere being created at mid-ocean ridges, should produce a pattern where the youngest ocean lithosphere is found at the ridge, with progressively older dates on either side traveling away from it. There should never be a break in this pattern apart from a volcanic island poking through the lithosphere and the pattern should match on either side of the ridge. If the lithosphere just sat there and the plates are not in motion, or if you think the plates are in motion today, but the world is only several thousand years old and Pangaea never existed, meaning almost all of the ocean floor was created at the same time, then this pattern cannot exist, but it does exist. So there, the last thing we need to look at is Hawaii. The Hawaiian island chain is different in that it is nowhere near a plate boundary or rift where virtually all other volcanoes are. Instead, it's right in the center of the Pacific plate. These islands were created by a hot spot, a rising plume of abnormally hot mantle material that rises through the lithosphere. The decrease in pressure as the mantle convects upwards allows this mantle rock to become molten. Only some of the volcanoes in the Hawaiian chain are active, the ones directly on top of the mantle plume. But there are many extinct volcanoes in the chain. You can see that the chain runs a dead straight line, then it has a kink, then another dead straight line. What happened is the mantle plume is localized and stationary. It is the Pacific plate that moves over the plume, while the plume punches up one volcanic island at a time. If the Pacific Plate wasn't in motion, then there shouldn't be a long straight chain of volcanoes, and it should not be the case that each individual island and underwater volcano is dated to progressively older and older dates as you move away from the active volcanoes, and that only the youngest volcanoes are still volcanically active. But it is the case. So there. And that concludes our short series on plate tectonics. Next time, we will begin a new unit on historical geology, where we will peer back four and a half billion years into Earth's past. Thanks for watching.